I am because I'm also signed into the YouTube. Okay. Okay, so it's preparing to go live. Yeah, I have it. So now you can just um, make me the host and we can let people in. I am because I'm also signed into the YouTube. Okay. Okay, so it's preparing to go live. Yeah, I have it. So now you can just um, make me the host and we can let people in. And I'm also signing to the Okay. Yeah, I have it. So now you can just um, make me the host and we can let people in. Clo close the live stream window, uh, the YouTube window. Close out of Safari. Where do we make you the host, Brad? On participants, if you go to more, on if you hover over my name and then go to more. No, it's here. Here. More. More. Right. Come back. Okay, you're the host. Great. Um, I'm just gonna change the. Um, Share screen, so Michael, you should screen it, and I'm going to admit the people then. Yep. Ready? Hey, do you have access to my Facebook page? I do not. Do you want to share that the, the Zoom the the? Yeah, I want to share, put on the put on the Facebook. You can enter a thing there. You know, put in the. I'll put it on the DJ Facebook, and then you can share it. I can't really because I can't use my phone because we're recording. So. Right. Um. Okay. I'm going to admit the people. Okay. Hello, Frank. Hey, Michael. How's everything in Belgium? Rainy. Good. Rainy. Good evening. Dirk, how are you? Great. Mr. Bridgewater, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Michael. How are you? Very good. Thanks yes. for coming. Pleasure, sir. Okay. Uh, Tanisha, turn on your video, just like in boot camp. Bob, love the background, really nice. I don't know what you've done to the living room, it's fantastic. Hi, Michael. Hello, Sandy, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Mr. Harvey, there you are. Good evening. You're looking very good. Thank you. I hope the lighting's improving things. Yeah, the lighting looks great. The secrets in the lighting. On the makeup. Good evening, Brett. Good evening, Paul. How are you? All right. Good afternoon, I should say to you. <laughs> Brett keeps promising he's going to make it to the pub quiz, but he hasn't turned up yet. Yeah. Do we know where he lives yet? No, not yet. No, I don't think so. Is it, is, it, uh, is it Brooklyn, is it? Yes, in Brooklyn. Yeah, in Brooklyn. Yeah, well, we're not going to go around there. No, we go around. <laughs> Hi, Michael. Derek, how are you? Great. Thanks for <laughs> Hello. Love hello. Love your book. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Don't forget the Amazon, the Amazon review. Five stars. <laughs> <laughs> can we record this, Michael, for future reference? Yes, feel free. Well, actually, we're going to record it and put it on YouTube, but you can make your own recording if you want. Okay, thank you. You're making too many notes. Anton. I haven't seen you since uh, Mint Tilly. Hello. Hi, Michael. How are you? 
How's the, how's the, uh, how's the used typewriter business going? It's going really well, actually. Really? So, um, okay. Yeah. No, I'm doing some quite interesting things. So um, there'll be lots of new photos appearing soon. Oh, great. And how's, how's selling my artwork? Anybody really interested or is that dead? Oh, the, the, the economy is dead here. Uh, you know, interior designer businesses, all that sort of stuff is just, uh, you know, they've, they've, all left the, they've all left the island. <laughs> have a nice life over there. It looks lovely. It's, it's really good. Yeah, the, the weather makes such a difference, so. Really nice. Did you always live there or have you moved there recently? No, I've had the place here for about 16, 17 years. It started off as a holiday home. Terrific. And, um, when I, you know, finished my last sort of relationship, I um, decided, yeah, I needed to kind of get away from the UK. It was just bring me down too much and it's a good hub for you know the chefing so lovely place yeah no it's absolutely gorgeous so you're more than welcome to come over anytime yeah. you like <laughs> got plenty of room vaccine, so it's just a matter of time now it's like normal. Mm. yeah mr mulaketa how are you <laughs> hi michael where are, you, where are you calling in from hi michael where are you, where are you calling in from Johannesburg, South Africa. Johannesburg. Tunisia, nice to see you. Hello, Caitlin. How's it going? Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. Thanks for turning up. I appreciate it. All right, we gave everybody, we said we'd start at one. We'll give everybody a few more minutes. We had 40 people sign up. I don't think all 40 will show, but at least it's pretty good turnout. Oh. Where's Lisa? She's not cooking in the background. Yeah, I off <laughs> to the kitchen. I don't know what she's doing, but I'm sure she'll come back. <laughs> she'll at least show up to say hello. Fantastic. Does everybody know Brett? Hello, everyone. Hi. Martin, how are you? Nice to see you in person. Yeah, I'm good. Good. Very good. Yeah. Is there any news about the elections? Well, yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, everybody agrees Trump has been elected except for Mr. Trump. So I think that uh, it's only a matter of time now until he comes to grip with reality. Emily, who is hopeful there? about that? Are you hopeful about that? Oh, no, no. It's, he's finished. He's dead. Thank God. But you know what I find upsetting is 70 million people still voted for him, which I find uh, pretty frightening. Unsettling, yeah. yeah. We have wow. a long way to go yet. All right, anyway, I think we'll get started. It's uh, like three minutes after. And Brett, if more people come, you can just let them in. Will do. Okay. So uh, welcome. Thank you for turning out for this. This is first sort of experiment in uh, these, uh, these online seminars. Brett, in fact, you're going to be doing one on live streaming. What's the date for yours? Well, I'm going to be doing one on smartphone shooting uh, in the December is when we're going to be doing that. More well, detail. I'm going to try to do this as a regular thing. This is the first time we've done this. So, um, this is obviously, for those of you who are interested in how to start and, oh, Mona, nice to see you. Welcome. Are you still in Colorado? Still connecting. So the, uh, the, 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 the base of this is how to start and run your own um, television station, which is kind of a, a euphemism and kind of something that's actually very, very doable now because of the technology. So we figure this is gonna run about an hour, maybe it run a little over. I'm gonna take about the first 45 minutes to explain the process and technique. And I would appreciate if you hold off on your questions until we get done with that. And then we'll open up the rest of the time for a, a Q and A. Uh, the bottom line here is that it is, if I had said 10 years ago that I'm gonna teach you how to start your own television station and make a profit out of it, which is the, the most important point, 
Because if you're not making a profit out of it, there's, there's really no point in doing it. So let me just click this thing on here because I told Lisa I would record separately. There we go, oh, wrong way. All right. Okay, so as I said, if I had run this thing 10 years ago and I said, I'm gonna teach you how to start your own television station and make a profit out of it, because there's no point in doing this unless you make money out of it, it would have been absolutely an act of insanity because even a decade ago, it cost somewhere in the neighborhood of anywhere from 100 million to $500 million to start a television station. And even then there was a lead time until it turned profitable. And as I'll tell you about as we get into this, I've built and designed about a dozen television stations around the world. So I've seen the process go as the technology has changed. But today, because mostly because of iPhones more than anything else and the internet, it is actually possible for anyone, and very few people have done this yet, this is such an interesting moment too, but it's entirely possible for anyone um, to build their own television stations. Television stations being kind of a, a euphemism. The days of talking about a broadcast station are pretty much finished because Nobody does that anymore. Brett, can we can we mute everybody because we've got open microphones running on? Yes. Yes. Great. So um, but what I'm gonna teach you to do in the next 45 minutes, remarkably, is to uh, if you do it, is to actually give you the nuts and bolts of how to create a television station, such as we call the television station, and make it a profitable business for yourself. And this is, you can actually do this, and we've had some example of people who've actually done this, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, when we say television, we don't mean that thing that sits in your living room. That's a kind of an archaic euphemism. The average American or the average person, I guess, in the rest of the world also, uh, if you read my new book, Don't Watch This, which is available on Amazon, spends an astonishing eight hours a day watching television. But by television, we mean Netflix, we mean Hulu, we mean broadcast, we mean cable, we mean YouTube, we mean this whole panoply of online video like we're doing now. Online video, whether it's streaming or pre-recorded, it's an abstraction, has become the number one human activity for most people in Western countries around the world. And there is no reason not to profit off of that. We spend more time watching television or video than we do working, reading, eating, even sleeping. It's our number one activity. So there's a way to leverage off of that, which is what I'm gonna teach you how to do. The media business is inherently different from any other profession or industry in the world. And it has been historically. Every other business, whether it's law or medicine or you know architecture is a body of study that goes contiguously. And as new technologies come along, they enhance the ability to perform that job. So if you're an architect, if you're an architect and CAD CAM came along and computers came along, you essentially did the same thing. It's just the technology allowed you to do it better. If you were a doctor, and you know, uh, uh, radial medicine comes along and a laser technology comes along, it allows you to do the same thing. In media, it's a very, very different world because technology leads first and the technology creates an industry. So for example, before Gutenberg, there was no print industry, it didn't exist. And Gutenberg's invention of the printing press unleashed the ability to make books and newspapers and stuff like that. Before Marconi, there was no radio. And so Marconi unleashed this notion of radio and broadcasting. Before, well, David Sarnoff actually, or, or if, if you're in Britain, J John Logie Baird invented television. There was no industry of television. The technology comes first and the, the industry and the business and the revenue comes after that. And if you're smart and you can look at the technology and understand what the technology is going to unleash, you can then create a business that's coherent with the technology and make a fortune. And the history of media is filled with examples of that even up until television. For example, I mean, when I was young and some of us were young, there was only broadcast television. So when I was a kid, there were seven channels in the United States and that was the entire universe of television. And Paul, I guess in England, there was one channel and then there were two and then maybe there were three. But essentially that was the world of television. If you wanted to work in television to make a living in television, that's all there was. And then in the 1980s, cable came along. And cable actually came along because people couldn't get broadcast clear channels. So some enterprising people put an antenna on top of a mountain and they said, now we'll run the cable, the broadcast thing into your home, but the cable could suddenly carry 50 and then 100 and then 200 and then 300 channels. This for those who could see it provided a terrific opportunity. So for example, 
a, a guy who's the AV department, you know, the AV department, the guys who used to roll the, the, the projectors around. He was the AV department at junior college named John Hendricks, looked at this cable capacity and said, I'm going to start a documentary channel. That channel is called Discovery. For those of you in America or Europe are familiar with it, this guy started from nothing, but he saw the empty space to be filled. Today, John Herricks has a net worth of $800 million. So the trick is to look at the technology and understand the potential that gets afforded by this thing. Ted Turner, who you're all familiar with, he actually, he had a, actually he a crappy broadcast um, UHF channel in Atlanta, Georgia that had about four people watching it, but he understood the potential that the combination of empty cable space and satellites had. So there were empty satellite transponders orbiting around the earth put up by the Americans like usual. So he leased the, he leased the space on the transponders, put up his terrible local television station in Atlanta, put it back down over the rest of the country and suddenly had content for every cable channel in America that had empty space and was looking for it. And Ted Turner's worth about three or $4 billion today. That's what we're going to do now. The great game changer here, cable is finished. The printing press already been invented. There's already radio. The great game changer here is two things. One is the smartphone. Everybody here's got a smartphone, right? You all got smartphones, right? Tanisha, as you already know, having done the boot camp with Spectrum, who we love, right? You can use your smartphone to make broadcast quality television by yourself. Isn't that right, Tanisha? Correct, because that's what you do, right? So when we went to Spectrum, which is, as you know, Spectrum is this huge operation. We'll talk about the deal with Spectrum shortly. We took all the Spectrum stations, like where Tanisha works, and we put all the people through the boot camp. You did the five-day boot camp, right, Tanisha? And we taught them to shoot and cut. And today, every Spectrum station, I've got 700 Spectrum uh, reporters across the country now, every one of them uses nothing but an iPhone to shoot and edit and produce all the pieces that they have, which means if they can do it, nothing personal, Tanisha, you can do it also, right? Anybody, what you have in your iPhone or your smartphone, I prefer iPhones, what you have in your iPhone is the equivalent of what would have cost you an astonishing $10 million to buy a decade ago. That is, you have a 4K broadcast quality camera that's four times high def. You have editing software, you have music, you have graphics, you have everything you need to make broadcast quality television by yourself. So you no longer need cameraman, soundman, producer, editor, reporter, all that junk that used to come with the thing. And nothing personal, if Tanisha can do it for Spectrum, although she gets paid for it, which is nice, you can do it for yourself to create your own channel. We'll talk about what kind of channel you should do in a minute. There's a fantastic opportunity, and like everything else in the media world, simply unleashed because the technology is there. And the technology wasn't there five years ago. The technology in your hands now, but most people have no idea what to do with it. That's what we're gonna talk about what to do. So one half of the revolution here is the advent of suddenly putting $10 million worth of broadcast quality equipment in your hands right now. The other half is the internet, which we all know about the internet. It's quite a remarkable thing. What the internet does is it allows you to put your content into 3.5 billion homes every day for free. That is astonishing. That is unbelievable. In the, in the media business, we talk about barrier to entry. And in the broadcast world, the barrier to entry used to be when it was broadcast through the air, like the BBC did or NBC did, the broadcast air was an FCC license. You couldn't get on the air, you couldn't get your product into people's homes without an FCC license, right? And then when cable came along, they bypassed the license and then you had to own the cable. And that's what these big cable companies like Spectrum do. They put the cable, they invested hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to lay cable down, connect all these homes, or in Britain, you had the square reel, right, for a while, with the aerial, with the satellite, and sky. The question was, how'd you get the content into people's homes? Because if nobody watches, it doesn't mean anything. The internet now allows you to bypass cable, allows you to by 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 cast, uh, bypass satellites, allows you to bypass broadcast. The internet means that you can get your content into 3.5 billion homes around the world every single day for free. That is astonishing. That is incredible. That is revolutionary. So you have all the tools you need between the phone, which allows you to make all the content, and the internet, which allows you to put the stuff into people's homes to build your own television station. And that is fantastic. Now the question is, what do you do with that? How do you take that piece of information and turn that into revenue, right? That would be the intelligent thing to do here, right? 
So the way not to do that is to put your stuff on YouTube. That is a stupid thing to do because YouTube makes money for who? It makes money for Google who owns YouTube, right? And those guys have billions. They have like fleets of private Boeing 777s. You don't have Boeing 777s, right? How many people put stuff here on YouTube? You post on YouTube all of that, right? Idiotic, don't do it anymore, right? They are charging advertising against your content. Now, I know all these theories about YouTube millionaires, right? You've all read about YouTube millionaires, right? Everybody knows about YouTube. Everybody wants to be a YouTube millionaire. YouTube, which is now what, 12 years old. Do you know how many YouTube millionaires there have been in the 12 years YouTube has been up? I guess 31 in 12 years. 1.9 billion people on YouTube, 31 millionaires over the last 12 years. That means you are better off taking your money and spending it on lottery tickets because the odds are greater on winning a million dollars on the lottery than it's going to be on YouTube. The other place you're getting screwed all the time is Facebook. Everybody on Facebook, right? All the time, right? You are giving your stuff to Facebook for free, right? Mark Zuckerberg makes money out of Facebook. Do you make money out of Facebook? No. Do you make money out of YouTube? No. You're giving away your content for free. That's an idiotic thing to do. So we're going to stop doing that. Instead, we're going to build our own little channel, our own little home, our own little space, and you can do this on, uh, you know, it's very easy to make a, to build your own channel. And from there, you can put up your videos or you can live stream and you can create your own personal channel, right? Paul Harvey TV, right? Paul, nobody unfortunately is going to see Paul Harvey TV except for maybe me and Bridgewater. So you're not going to make a fortune out of this thing. So the trick is if you want to be in the television business and when you want to create your own television station, your own little space, your own little space, and you can build these with WordPress. Everybody knows WordPress, right? It's free. Any nine-year-old can, can, can build a website with WordPress. Any moron can do it. That's the place to put your videos, putting your video on YouTube, putting your video on, on Facebook, um, uh, watch, putting your YouTube on Instagram TV, IGTV. Totally idiotic, stupid waste of time. You're giving stuff away to other people. There's no point in doing it. But you can create your own little channel of whatever the channel is. So the question is, what should the channel be? Here's the real secret to success here. You can write this down if you want. There's a direct correlation between the, the size and the scope of any media footprint and the content that's offered. I know you don't understand what I mean, but I'm explaining that to you right now. In the very early days of broadcast television, there were only three television networks in America, for example, NBC, ABC, CBS. In Britain, there was BBC and later ITV. And because there was only one channel and only one way to do this, um, those channels, because it was so limited a footprint, those channels essentially offered everything. So NBC did news, they did sports, they did game shows, they did every stupid thing you could find, right? And that's when cable came along, and suddenly you got more and more channels. The very first cable channels like USA, which was the biggest cable channel in America in the beginning, also offered everything. When I was young, a long time ago, I had a contract with Christian Science Monitor, with the Christian Science Monitor, which you may be familiar with. And I was a journalist for Christian Science Monitor with my little camera, and I made pieces for it. Christian Science Monitor had a nightly news show on the Discovery Channel, every night for an hour with John Hart. Because even in those days, Discovery believed they should offer all things, sports, weather, news, just because they mimic the broadcast channels. But over time, the cable channels came to understand that they had to specialize. So if you look at cable in the University of Cable, it became the Food Network, the Travel Channel, ESPN for sports, they began to diversify. As the footprint gets larger, you have to diversify, you have to get more and more niche oriented to attract an audience. So if you're going to start your own cable, your own broadcast channel, which I urge you to do, your own TV channel online, you don't want to have, first, you don't want to do news. Forget about news. Nobody's interested. It's terrible. And a lot of people do this. They do, I'm going to do hyper-local news. I'm going to do local news stories. That is an idiotic thing to do. Do not do that because it's too competitive. The thing to do is to go to a very small niche. And the smaller the niche, the better. So for example, Anton, as weird as it sounds, you have this thing with used typewriters, right? Yes, and there's a whole cult of used typewriter people, right? But there is, there, there is, but there is nobody, there is nobody who has a, there is no used typewriter channel that you can think of, right? You go on, no. So off the top of your head, Anton, how many people in the world do you think have an interest in used typewriters? 100,000? A million? I don't know. 
Nobody knows. We'll find out. So I'm not telling you what to do, but I would say in theory, if you were to launch the used typewriter channel and you called 100,000 people and you got them to pay you a dollar a month, we'll talk about revenue in a second, that's $100,000 a month in revenue. That's pretty good for a cable channel, right? Now, if you discover, you'd be out of business. But for you, broadcasting from your lovely island home, that's the even 50,000, right? Raise your hand, Anton. Would you do it for 100,000 a month? Yes, 50,000 a month, 20,000 a month, 10,000 a month. You see what I mean? There's profit to be made in here. The more you reduce, right? Mona, is there a granola channel in the world? No, go make one. How many people love granola? They buy it. Mona's granola, definitely go buy it. How many people love your granola, right? Bridgewater, you do airplanes, right? Is there, there's no airplane channel, strangely enough, is there? How many people love old planes in the world? 50 million? Probably, right? These are the channels you have to create. So you have to look at the technology and you say, I have to marry this now to something that is a niche that doesn't exist. The weird thing is, and we'll talk about this in a second, the weird thing is um, there's lots and lots of places. So for example, this morning, thinking about this thing, I went to Google and I Googled pizza, right? Just the word pizza. I got 1.8 billion responses to pizza, right? Pizza is very popular. There is no pizza channel now. You might want to start a pizza channel. I think it could get a lot of popularity very, very quickly, right? Then ironically, because I want to show you a video in a second. I want to show you another video. I Googled barbecue. Pizza got 1.8 billion. Barbecue got 8.2 billion hits on Google. That tells you something. So you could, in theory, create the barbecue channel, right? Nobody has it. There's the food network and there's, there's the cooking channel, but they are still broad because in their world, the, the universe is only 500 or 800 cable channels. But the real universe of online is essentially 100 million opportunities. So therefore, the bigger the footprint, the more focused the thing has to be. So if you went out and you created the, the barbecue channel, just an example, what would you put on it? You have the phone, you have the potential to make content, and now what are you gonna do? Here's the secret to successful content. Here's the basic rule. Even if you get the channel, and even if you get the access, and even if you get into people's homes, if nobody is watching, it's a waste of time, right? And what do people watch? This was the great lesson that we learned from doing the Spectrum Station. So I'll, I'll, I'll depart a little bit for a moment to talk about our experience with Spectrum, because this is important for the kind of content you're gonna to have to make to make your channel work. 30 years ago, looking at technology, which is a good trick to do, 30 years ago in the television business, I saw little cameras, little home video cameras. Home video cameras were first coming out. And I got the idea that instead of having a cameraman, a sound man, a producer, a crew, and all this kind of stuff, you could shoot your whole stories with using these little cameras by yourself. So I invented this thing called video journalism or MMJ or Mojo, whatever it is, and went on to a very nice career of building television stations around the world based on this technology, right? And it was cost effective. So we built, I don't know, 30, 40 television stations based on this notion. Later, when more and more people got their hands on this stuff, as you probably know, I partnered with Al Gore and we built a television channel called Current TV, which was based on user generated content, just like you. Make the stuff and put it up here. So we sold that channel about five or six years ago for $500 million, which just goes to show you, if you can make these things work, they turn into a very, very nice little business. We got approached by Spectrum, which is where Tanisha works, and Spectrum was gonna start a 24-hour news channel in Los Angeles. And they said, we want you to come out to LA and do the channel. And we didn't really wanna do it. But we went out to LA and we said, we'll do it under two conditions. First, only iPhones, no cameras, no cameramen, no, and they did it. And second, and this is the interesting part for us going into this thing. We said, we don't wanna do news stories because nobody's interested in news, nobody really cares. What we wanna do is we wanna take Hollywood movie making techniques and marry them to the channel. And much to their credit, they did it. And with 18 months, Spectrum One in LA became the number one rated channel, not just news channel, the number one rated channel in Los Angeles, because essentially, and it's a big market, they did stories about people. In other words, we made little movies. People naturally gravitate to stories about people. Nobody's interested in facts. Nobody's interested in information. Nobody's interested in narrative. 
People like little movies. And the reason why people like little movies is because at the end of the day, everybody goes home and they turn on their TV and what do they watch? They watch Netflix, they watch Hulu, they watch, that's what you all watch, right? You all watch these things, you watch the series, right? Breaking Bad, all that stuff, right? It's always the same story. It's a character, an arc of story and a resolution. So when we went to Spectrum One in LA, we said, we're gonna make movies, but we're gonna marry it to content and news. And that's what we did. And the thing turned out to be so successful that now we're committed to building out all the Spectrum stations across the country based on this model. This is what you must do. First, you must pick your topic and pick some topic you have a personal passion for because you're gonna spend the next two or three years doing that, but nothing but that. And that's entirely up to you. I mean, I know some of you and I know the stuff you're interested in. Mona, I know you like the granola. And uh, Anton, I know you like the old typewriters. And Stephen, I know you like the old airplanes. So these things are very logical. And these are places you want to go. And that is what you have to become. So you will go and you will become the world expert in old air online. My channel is the, the go-to place. That's what you want to create. The go-to place for old air airplanes. The go-to place for old typewriters the go-to place for granola. It, you'd be surprised what little tiny niches, the dumbest things in the world, fly fishing, wooden doll houses, wooden boats, none of these things are taken. This is like when the internet came along and URLs first started to open up and you could go grab like, you know, tv.com because nobody had it. So go and grab your niche, whatever niche you decide to do and own it. A million years ago, really a million years ago, when I started doing this thing with little cameras on my own, this Swedish billionaire, you probably know this story, found me and he understood the economics of what I had done. And he flew me to Stockholm and he said, can you teach other people to do this? And he capitalized my first company. And when I met him in Stockholm, he said to me, what do you do? And I said, well, I make little videos with my camera. He said, no, you are the world expert in the video revolution. And I said, I don't think so. And he said, yes, you are. And from now on, if anybody asks you, you tell them that's what you are. And the guy was a billionaire and my new business partner. I thought, okay. So everywhere I went, I said, I am the world expert in the video revolution. And people thought, who is this jerk, this arrogant putz? But after three or four years of saying it, I was the world expert, even though I don't know anything. And that's how you do it. So Stephen, you have to become the world expert in online airplane videos, whatever it is. And, and Anton, you've become the world expert in all typewriter videos, okay? And once you do that, people will actually, it's quite remarkable, be actually will come to you. So pick your niche and find it. And then once you found your niche, now you have to start creating the videos because that's what people want to watch. And what you have to do is you have to take your phone and you have to start making little stories about people. These are relatively easy to do. I'm going to show you one, right? And this is since I found out about this, this is, we did this thing about um, 8.2 billion people love barbecue. If one of you guys wants to launch the barbecue channel, it's your ground, go for it, no problem. But I want to show you a barbecue video. This is a stupid thing. It's a little story about barbecue. It was done by um, a Susan Arbeter, who also did the the, she's a spectrum. Uh, uh, she was a spectrum producer. She did the same boot camp that Tanisha did. These are all the lessons you can learn on the VJ.com. It's no different. I like the boot camps better, but if you want to do it, any idiot can make videos like this. This was the second. She took the lessons. This is the second video she ever made in her life. I'm going to show it to you. Right? It is as good as anything you'll see on television. She had no prior experience. She did the lesson. She followed the five shot rule. All that crap you'll learn about if you go through with this thing. She shot it on a phone. She cut it on a phone. It's a little video about um, it's a little video about um, barbecue. But this is the kind of stuff that you know, for better or for worse, this is what appeals to people. So let's take a look at this. It's a very nice little story, right? And you'll see that she was not, and she did not a cameraman. She was not a documentary filmmaker. She made this entirely on a phone. But this is a barbecue video, and this is the kind of junk that you can make on your phones to populate your channel. So let's take a look at this. This is Barbecue from the Ironworks Grill in Troy, New York. It's owned by Howard Gross, a guy with a face that screams, I love food. We want to bring back the times in the 70s when people sat around the table, like only a month ago when we were all locked in our houses together, to sit together and have dinner, a real cooked meal. Keith is Howard's brother. The two of them have wanted to own a restaurant since they were kids, and they get along well. Well, we can work together. We work together well. Yeah. 
I tell him what to do and he does it. It's easy. Mostly. No, that's not right. Whatever. Very interesting, and you know I'm her favorite, right? There's no <laughs> doubt you are her favorite. Ironworks opened in the middle of the pandemic. Well, barbecue now, because we have to cook outside, so it's easy. And that, according to some of our customers, we're pretty good at it. I'll take the pan. Howard is good at it. Yeah. He's done competitive barbecue, which is apparently a thing. And now he's expanding his repertoire with the help of chef Deshaun Dandridge and his daughter Janae. They've introduced some old family recipes like cobbler. I'm making the crumble for the cobbler. Dee's recipe is awesome. Why is it so good? It's good because it's made with love. This is what love looks like in case you were wondering. How do you know they're done? You know they're done when you can pull the bone out like this. Chef D has been cooking for 35 years and he knows what makes good barbecue. And this is it. Good flavor. This is what you expect in a nice pork. Want a little bit of the, a little, want a little bit of the crunch, a little bit of the bark for the outside. But then when you go in, you want to have a nice little bit of texture, a little bit of, a little bit of fat to add to the juiciness, just a little bit. And the customers seem to like it. How is it? Really good. Candy. Kids love cotton candy. The only thing left for an excitable foodie is dessert. First scoop. First scoop. Ever. Ever. Oh, man. <sighs> Couldn't. That's a pretty generous scoop. Mmm, it's so good. I told you, a face that loves food. That's really good. You like cotton candy ice cream? You're a grown man. Shh, don't tell my wife. Susan. Okay. It's a nice barbecue from the Ironworks Grill in Troy, New York. It's a nice little story, right? It's a simple video. Shot on a phone, cut on a phone, highly watchable, character driven. You can turn that kind of thing around in a day or two. It's very, very simple to do. Now, this is the kind of stuff that you have to make. And you can learn to make this. Anybody can make this kind of stuff with a phone. She did it by herself. It's not, you don't need a cameraman, soundman, producer, director, other than editor, all that kind of crap. You can make it yourself and you begin to populate your website with that kind of stuff. Now, the question, because there's two ways to go here. First of all, once you start to, uh, let's take this first. How do you make money out of it? This is the real critical issue because it's great to make video. It's great to put the video up. But where does the revenue come from? So in the world of media, there are three revenue sources, right? One of them is advertising. One of them is subscription. And one of them is selling a product. Forget about advertising. Advertising is debt. You are never going to be able to sell enough ads, mostly because most online business, even the online newspapers are going out of business because YouTube and Facebook suck down and Google suck down 85% of online advertising. So that is dead, you can forget about that. Second is the subscription model. Very, very difficult, possible. And in some places where people are really, you know, deeply dedicated, like Stephen, maybe you could run a subscription model because you have a very core group. They mean, they, they, you're already an editor for a magazine, right? So there's, there's people do pay for that. The, the third way to make money out of this thing is to sell stuff that is part and related to the, the thing that you're selling, like Mona has her granola, like Anton has his, his, his things, sell a product that goes along with it. If you, obviously, if you have a product already, this makes it very easy. If you don't have a product, what you can do is you can tie up with somebody who does have a product. So for example, if you open the, the fly fishing channel and that's your love, you can make deals with people who make all the fly, I don't know what they have reels and rods and flies and God knows what kind of crap they have. And there are manufacturers all over the world that make these things. And you can create on your website, click and buy, just like Amazon does. So if you're watching the video, you can then click on the product and do a purchase through these people. And you can take 10 or 15% as a commission, which I'm sure the manufacturer would be happy to do. So the first thing is to figure out your niche. And the second thing then is to find a, pro a revenue source. Advertising, death, subscription, very unlikely. Um, on the other hand, selling junk is a, is a fantastic way to create revenue. So I'm gonna show you another video. This is from another person who took the boot camp. This is a woman named Katie Salt. She also shot this on a phone, cut it on a phone, 
It's a profile of a husband and wife team who opened uh, you know, a fitness studio and they took the whole thing online. Particularly in the era of COVID, this is really popular. They just do exercises or whatever kind of crap they do online. And they have, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 people, not a big number that follows them, but where they make revenue, not out of the content, which they give away for free, free content everyone is used to, they make the revenue and they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars out of t-shirts and hats and crap like that. So two pur two purpose in showing this. One, this is another example of content that you can make with a phone. And the other is buried in this story is a great lesson about um, a revenue source. So let's take a look at this. This doesn't run that long. Also a product of the boot camp. She learned how to do it. You can make, she, I think this is the first piece she ever made in video also. You can do the same thing. Easy to do, but watch the piece. Very interesting lesson here about revenue sources. Now let's add that push up in. Good. Seven days a week, you'll find Almost Cindy Cummings there. pushing We've herself hard during her daily Three, workouts. Two, one, and rest. Good job. But she isn't working out alone. She has more than 500,000 people watching her. Sydney and her fiance Dustin started a YouTube channel about two years ago that gives people free workouts every single day. And Sydney has people joining her for her workouts from around the world. In the last 28 days, there's been six and a half million views and over almost, almost two million hours viewed. It was the United States and then um, the UK is next, Canada, India, Italy, Germany, Australia, Saudi Arabia. Here in Charlotte, Brooke Jordan tunes in daily for Sydney's workouts. She was forced to find alternatives after both of her gyms closed in March because of coronavirus. And I had a friend tell me about Sydney's workouts, so I figured I'd give them a try. And I've been doing them ever since. You like them? I do. They're very helpful. It's very easy. While Brooke continues to work out at home, Sydney and Dustin stay busy at the studio packaging and selling piles of merchandise. And eventually people started asking like, hey, can we have a t-shirt to represent your channel? And we're like, yeah, sure. And then it just kept branching out to more and more products that people were asking for. So our demand has grown truly and genuinely from the requests of the community. The majority of our items tend to sell out. Uh, the longest one we've had so far is about four hours, um, but typically things sell out in anywhere from 24 minutes to under an hour. And once they leave the studio, they still have hours of work left to do at their home office. Dustin edits the videos and Sydney fine tunes and tweaks the workouts for the next day. A lot of what we catered in the first month, uh, and I would say leading after that was body weight options. So we already have almost 200 on the channel, but new ones that if they are weighted, here's also an option for you to have uh, a non-weighted movement. She also group, checks in with her Sydney squad, a group of people cool. around the world looking for a little bit of accountability. Saturday. This is kind of like my digital way to cultivate community. Minutes here, cool down. Back in her Be apartment, cool Brooke down. is cooling down and ready to take on the rest of her day. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I didn't really know what I was going to do in terms of, you know, an exercise routine, but once I found these videos, it's certainly given me a sense of normalcy and now I have something to look forward to during the day. Normalcy and a new type of routine from the comfort of her living room. In Charlotte, Katie Solt, Spectrum News One. Okay, so two lessons there. One is you see the quality of the video. Shot on an iPhone, cut an iPhone by somebody who had really never done this before. It's very watchable and easy to do and easy to turn around in a day. The other thing is the story itself this couple, you know, whatever their names are, and her fiance, they, they give out the content for free. They have home exercise, not the most demanding thing in the world, but they make their revenue on the t-shirts and the hats and the books and the backpack and everything else. You can do this. People naturally build a, some kind of a strange affinity to television programming. Don't ask me why. That's just the nature of our culture. We're very addicted to this thing. So if you can create a channel that attracts people in your niche, whether it's exercise or airplanes or yoga or barbecue or pizza, whatever the thing is, and you can create this, you're fine. Now, we come to the question of content and you say, at Discovery, they have, I don't know, 30,000 employees making and production companies making stuff all day long. I'm just me by myself, how do I do this? Well, as it turns out, it doesn't take that much content to create and maintain the channel. What we found, Brett, we found with our own YouTube channel, right, is that basically people come back to the same videos over and over and over again. 
So if you can create one or two videos a week, you're in pretty good shape. But if you get really good at that, let's take a lesson here from uh, Mark Zuckerberg or the guys at, at, um, at uh, Google or, or YouTube or anywhere else. And that is to open the platform. And that is once you own the platform, once you own pizza time or barbecue time or the airplane channel or the used typewriter channel, once you own it, then you can feel free to open it to other people to contribute. This is the architecture of content in the world of the internet, as opposed to the architecture of content in the world of broadcast. So let me show you what I mean by that, right? I put a little tiny graphic here, but I'll show it to you anyway. It's not the best thing in the world. I do these myself. So if we look at this graphic, this is how conventional media works. People make stuff up here, like employees of the New York Times make stuff, and then it's put out on a broadcast or a newspaper or radio, and then people down here watch it, and then that becomes the content, and that's where content comes from. In the world of conventional media, this is how content is done all the time. The internet is inherently different. Let's take a look at a little graphic of how the internet works, right? On the internet, you open the platform. Once you own the platform, the trick is to own the platform first, create the platform and own it, then you open it. So in any online platform up here is, for example, eBay. Here's all the people in the world who put junk into eBay and they do it with their own, you know, gladness of heart or JDate or Airbnb or TripAdvisor or Facebook. This is what you're putting stuff into. And down here, here's all the people who use the thing. And all day long, the internet makes these connections and you as the business, you put yourself here. So if you want to open the pizza channel, for example, you create the channel, you own the channel, you make your own videos, but then you open it up to anyone in the world who wants to put up their pizza videos. People are dumb, because we all do it on Facebook every day, right? We all do it on you. We are dumb as everybody else. So make Anton, go make the used typewriter channel and invite people to submit their own stuff. They'll do it. It's quite shocking. They'll do it remarkably. You'll bring in more people. You'll have more content. And then you can go sell your t-shirts or whatever, or you can sell my screen prints of the typewriter, which I think is, why not? We'll split the thing 50-50. So that's the nature of the architecture of how you make money out of the channel. You don't make money out of the channel by selling advertising. That is inherently crazy. And you don't make money out of the channel by charging subscriptions. That is a very, very hard road to hope. And if you don't have a thing that you have a particular passion for, if you don't have a thing with used typewriters, we were in the granola business like, like Mona is, or you know whatever business you're in, whatever you want to sell, if you don't want to make the t-shirts, then the thing is to go out and find yourself a partner that has stuff that they want to sell and do a deal with them. In my own opinion, 50-50 is always the best and nobody feels like they're getting screwed. You sell their stuff, you promote it, whatever you sell online, you take a percentage of, they do the thing. That is the way to do this and that is the way to monetize the channel. But the channel is remarkably easy to do. So that's a lot. Did everybody get a lot out of this so far? Yes, okay. So, all right, you get the concept? This is easy to do. As I said before, I'm gonna just wrap this up and then we'll open up the remaining time for Q and A. We go as long as you want because I got nothing else to do today. I'm happy to answer all your questions, right? In my own experience, because I tell you from my own experience, I have built, I don't know, 15, 20 television channels around the world. And each time the technology changed, we build the channel slightly differently. But the thing is always the same. It's like a bottomless pit for media content because we live in a society that basically lives in front of a screen. People spend eight hours a day staring at screens and they eat content. They consume content like crazy. So the business to be, did you know the world television business is worth one point, just television is $1.72 trillion. It is bigger than the global petroleum business. You think I should own an oil well. You have an oil well right now with your iPhone. All you gotta do is pay attention and put it together and architect one of these things. So this is relatively easy to do. We've built these things all over the world and every time the most successful ones we have are the ones that take the newest technology and get ahead of the curve and build something based on what the technology offers. But it's always about offering content because I don't know, content is a weird thing. If you make shoes, you have shoes, you see the shoes. If you're in the food business, you have sandwiches. Content, it's like, it's amorphous. It doesn't really exist. But this is what we consume as a, probably in the end it's destruction of the Western world. But this is our number one thing that we consume even more than granola, Mona. We consume content 24 hours and we eat content. I don't know why we eat content, but we eat content. 
particularly video content. 85% of the content that's online now is video. That's just the society that we're in. So you have all the tools that you need to make a video. You can become a video, it's like growing rice or growing corn or raising chickens. You can grow and raise content and sell it. All the pieces are here. All you have to do now is put it together. Okay, so that pretty much, that leaves us 15 minutes for Q&A. If you have any questions, feel raise your hand and uh, then on mic. So, and also we're on two screens, which will make it a little more complicated. So we'll just go back and forth. Yes, Bob, you have a question. Open your mic, fire away. When you say that the, that you uh, a particular channel doesn't exist, how do you search this out? What do you search for? You, you go to Google and search barbecue. You like you said, you get millions or trillions of. How do you find out if there's a channel that exists for that? Well, I would I, first of all, even those people who did the home exercise thing, you see, they're on YouTube, which I think is a dumb thing. To, oh. Let me make a note. Social media is fantastic for driving people to your site. So don't hesitate to put stuff on Instagram or YouTube. I wouldn't say ignore them, but just little clips and you want to put links in. But to answer your question, Bob, I would go to YouTube and I would, you know, I would Google barbecue TV and you'll probably find three or four and you'll probably find they're all terrible. So that wouldn't be a disincentive for me with um, 8.2 billion people searching for it. I think you could start your own, but the more, the more refined you get, you know, the, the, the better your chances of owning the space. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, Shelly, you got a question? You'll have to raise your hands because there's so many people here. Shelly, go ahead. Yeah. Um, how long should these pieces be? Yeah, that's a very good question. We find the sweet spot for the videos is one to two and a half. After two and a half, people get bored. And one, they really don't have enough time to get into it. But, you know, one minute video, one minute 50, one minute 30, that's pretty much what holds up. People have very, very short attention spans. The days of making documentary hours is pretty much over. So, any other questions? Um, Emily, do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. When you say open it up for people to submit content, do you mean like a social media platform where they're posting their own videos or if not, how do you keep the quality? They, they, they can submit the links to you and then you can, you know, you can edit them or they can submit them. Then if you think they're terrible, you can take them down right away. You don't want destructive things. But I think this notion of opening to other people, it's, it's, you look at, you know, every successful company that's a pure online play does the same thing. So, you know, Learn from Facebook and learn from the best, and, and why not? You know, why not? The more, the more content you want, even if the content is terrible. I mean, look at YouTube, you know, look at eBay, you know? There is no executive editor at eBay who says, oh, old GI Joe dolls, we're not running them. eBay has everything imaginable, and if you're not interested, you won't look at it. And pretty soon it'll aggregate out on your own site, what people like and what people don't like. Let the internet tell you instead of trying to guess it. Samson you have a question from South Africa. Uh, thanks, Michael. So the question is about platforms and uh, what websites to, uh, you said uh, WordPress, but is it fairly straightforward? You have some recommendations as to uh, where, how to do that. And, and, and secondly, uh, in terms of uh, revenue, for, uh, no, it's choosing your, your niche. For example, uh, I, I'll tell you, it's a very, very difficult uh, situation if you are a generalist. Uh, for, for example, I am a former foreign correspondent it, uh, for new, uh, Newsday in New York. Uh, so I have 20 years of experience as a foreign correspondent. And then I'm, I'm, I was born in Ethiopia. So I immigrated from Addis Ababa to Ethiopia. And, and then... Uh, uh, became American, naturalized, uh, be joined a, a newspaper and then was po posted in South Africa, where after four years, I, after traveling to 62 countries, settled in South Africa and uh, owned a couple of restaurants and then became uh, involved in the salsa world. Now I have the, like a big 21,000 yeah. following on Facebook of salsa. Yeah, so- I your video, Samson, from Salsa. Yeah, it was right. Great. You yeah, each salsa dancing. That's enough. Forget right. the correspondence crap. That days are over. <laughs> <laughs> Just got you made a great video. So I would do that if I were you. I think that's the place to go. And then you can have so, music and all other stuff that goes with it. 
That's exactly the when you have a lot of interest. Uh, it's and a add chips. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sauce. <laughs> Sauce. <laughs> So, for example, I would say I would expand it to dancing instead yeah. of salsa because it's a, a, a bit more broader. Right. And then uh, it's also geographically, I'm in South Africa and Johannesburg, but it's a worldwide uh, yeah. need. So yeah. there are examples of people who are doing it the right way yeah. that you could point us to so that we can... Uh, it's really... I have the skills to make the videos. Yeah. Uh, so I just want the platform and uh, examples of people who are doing it, say, for whether it's yoga or anything else that you can... Uh... Well, Samson, there are, there, are, there are several, I mean, I like, you know, there are several platforms you can use. So, Brett, maybe in your thing in uh, December, you can talk about platforms. We can take a little research on that. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do that. If you come back to Brett's December thing, we'll have a whole thing on different platforms that you can use. But most of them are free, or they cost next to nothing. Frank, you got a question? Frank, you're on mute. Frank, open your microphone. All right, there you go. Uh, we talked about it in, um, in Oxford already, but should you do every time, each time, the paperwork? Because with the venue and the people you're using, and, and you're using people in venues for your profit. No, I, Frank, yeah, yeah, we did, Frank and Dirk both took the course at Oxford University, but uh, Frank, it's people want to participate, the, there's no paperwork involved here, this is not a, a broadcast operation, you don't need releases so far because of the, the, uh, the safe harbor thing online, so I think, that, but we can't, you can't use music, it's the only thing that you'll get sued for is you can't use commercial music, but if you want to have people sign releases, that's fine, but I wouldn't say it's an absolute requirement, not at this point. Okay. Dirk, you got a question? Yeah, one question. Uh, I know everything about these beautiful little stories, but your whole channel should consist with these. Uh, you make only these stories and no interviews, no background. No, no you know, I, I'm not a big fan of interviews, Dirk. I don't think people want to watch them. I and mean, you can try it. That's the advantage of the internet. You can, you know, you can put stuff up, but it won't work. The issue to that website has all the different testing locations on it. I'll just do go to that website. Um, someone's someone's mic is open. U V location, the IHC location. I also gonna do IHC one because our insurance is there. Yeah. 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 Because the one on rice cycles was down. It's not my dough. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, Tonisha, you got a question? Uh, two questions. First question is going back to WordPress. Do you have, um, is that the only one that you really recommend or do you have like a top three? No, and no. then the second thing is yeah. for these videos, um, once you start inviting other people to your platform, are you then also now needing to share how you're doing these videos? Kind of like that process so that you kind of keep the consistency. No, I, I would say, well, to answer the first question, I don't want to recommend anything right now. I'll leave that to Brett for his session. We'll do some research and find out which has the best stuff for what we're going to do. But um, as far as the, the question about sharing how you do with people, I mean, that's really up to you. You know, I mean, obviously all the trade secrets you learned in the boot camp, you can't give out or we'll have to sue you for a million dollars. But you know, <laughs> I think I tend to think I would prefer just an open platform and let people do what they want to do. Stuff that works, works, and stuff that doesn't work, doesn't work. Um, there's a thing here on the chat thing from somebody who's off the screen for a second. Uh, uh, Doa Hussein, are you there? I, you must be on the other screen. Doa, are you there? Um, I think his, his camera and microphone are just off, but... Um... Okay, so he's got two questions. Most trending online content creators right now present videos in a funnier or more amicable way or tone. In your opinion, is this the best approach to adopt when deciding which videos format? Again, the great thing about being online is you can try different formats or different approaches and you'll see very quickly what gets the views and what doesn't. So you can aggregate based upon what your viewers are telling you. I wouldn't say one way or the other. Why is YouTube not profitable? If I know we can see numerous millionaires these days because they're posting videos there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I see a problem. It's all right. 
Um, YouTube, fundamentally, you don't make a lot of money out of YouTube because YouTube takes the lion's share of the money for themselves. They want content so they can run advertising. They give you a pittance unless you have like a million followers, which is unlikely you're going to have. So my recommendation is own the content yourself, own the site yourself, but use things like YouTube to drive people to your site, right? Right on our YouTube channel, what do we make? About $12 a month now, right? So it's uh, just about just about that. So I don't really recommend it. Fernando, you got a question? Where are you, Fernando? Um, I'm here in South Florida, Boynton Beach. Oh, right, right. You got the Florida, you got the Florida channel, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah, so this is one of the biggest reasons I, I joined on this, uh, this group sessions to find out, can the Florida Voice use this platform to gather information throughout Florida? Because with a uh, TV network is section per county. So can the Florida Voice create a TV channel for the entire state of Florida? Yeah, you create a TV channel for the whole world. That's the whole point of the internet. I mean, how many people even outside of Florida, certainly in New York, are interested in what's happening in Florida? So Got it. Yeah, you, you're right. A lot of Florida have a lot of retirees and people do move yeah. out. So... Yeah. Uh, yeah. this, something. All right. Thank you so much. Exactly. You bet, man. Anybody else? Caitlin, you got a question? Yeah, I am. Um, so I'm a news reporter and I went through that training with you, but the book, yeah. Caitlin, would you recommend it for everybody? Yeah, no, it was awesome. Right. I really enjoyed doing story, yeah. like stories a lot more now, but my biggest thing, like I know how to do the video editing, all that stuff, social media, but finding that focus, yeah. um, I'm interested in a lot of things, but not like super passionate about one specific thing. How would you suggest like I narrow that down? Well, I think if, if you have, I would narrow it down to several areas because you're going to live with this thing, whatever it is for a long time. And so I would suggest that you pick three or four and then do some research like Bob's just, Bob also graduated the Oxford course. Uh, do like Bob does and do some research and find the one that you feel is the most, you know, it's, it's a trade off. The one that has the most people interested versus the one with the most competition. And then you have to sort of dedicate yourself to that. And the problem with, you know, because like at Spectrum, you're a general assignment reporter, so you're doing everything. And I wouldn't recommend quitting your day job at the moment. But when it comes to creating your own channel, you really have to be very, very focused on the narrower, the, it's a real basic algorithm. The bigger the footprint in terms of media world, the narrower the, the, the area you concentrate on, the better you'll do. Just because there's less competition and you'll hold more people. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Brett, did you want to say something? We have, a, we have a question from the YouTube live stream that I can post to you if that's all right. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, Abatsi wants to know what you think of OTT channels. You know, the. Yeah, the, OTT, OTT, OTT channels. channels. Yeah, OTT stands for over the top, and they refer to the channels that are on your smart TV where you click through and find them. And that's great for OTT if you can get access to smart TVs. But having tried to do that with, uh, with several of our clients, it's difficult to do, so I don't really recommend it for the moment. If you get a lot of people, then you can, you know, you can try and do it, but it's difficult. Okay, anybody else questions? We're here, we're taking questions all day. Mona, go ahead. Hi. Mona, also you can pimp your granola here. Go ahead, take 30 seconds and do us. So that's what it's all about. So I wanted, I have a granola product. I have a big mail order business and in the grocery stores. So I want people to understand the nutritional foundation of why we made this granola. And my approach was going to be developing people that have nutritional deficiencies and then they have a disease and then what foods they should eat to heal so they're not taking medication. But, you know, simple, like we use raw wheat germ because it has high in vitamin E and vitamin E is really good for your skin. And if you don't, you can have all these skin diseases. So that's the concept. And that's fascinating to me. But after, you know, 30 seconds of information, it's boring. So I thought I would connect that information to now that you feel good and you're healthy, you've got to go out and have fun. So I wanted to have a, a scene where we show people eating granola, then we talk about the nutrition, then we go do something fun. And it could be a bike ride on a, a mountain, or it could be going on the train to a ski resort, or it could be going to a park, you know, whatever it might be. And there'll be a million options. So I wanted to see if you thought that was a good idea to make the nutrition more exciting, because then you see it as we can go have fun because now we have the energy and we're healthy. Yeah, we no, do fun things. that's the way to go. If, if I take a lesson here from, you know, of course, we're all going to watch network news at night and all the ads are for pharmaceuticals. So if you see the ads for Optivo, right, wouldn't you like to live a few hours longer? 
and you, nobody there has cancer. I mean, they all look terrific, right? They're all riding bicycles and having lunch with their grandchildren, and that's the, that's the essence here, right? Just people having fun and being interesting and doing stuff is what attracts people. You can slide your nutritional stuff underneath because that's the place to put it. Okay, right, so it's something like marrying the nutrition with the travel channel. Yes, exactly, exactly right. And the more fun it is to watch, the more people are going to come to it. No question. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, Stephen. comment on a question really i think it was bob who asked about making the videos funny um i guess there's no better thing than bad publicity sometimes we've got a guy over here who is um making a living out recording airliners landing he takes his van with a video camera to heathrow and yeah. he just spends all day with things coming and he is notoriously bad he misidentifies things and i think more people watch the material because he is bad <laughs> than actually because of the, the good quality Absolutely. I mean, also train spotters, you know, it's the same thing. When we did the BBC, we had a guy who did nothing but, you know, profile train spotters. I mean, these guys are, you know, anoraks, but fascinating to, to make great TV. So it's all about ratings, you know, it's whatever pulls people in. So I would definitely do with that. I would definitely go with that. Cool. Any other questions? Let's check the other screen just to make sure we haven't missed anybody. Anyone on this side? Sandy, you got a question? Open your mic, Sandy. Yeah. I, I am. Hi. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Michael. So I, I know you want to talk about the platform another time, but say you basically you have a web, you're saying you have a website and then you put content on your website in the form of videos, but would you, wouldn't you still host the videos, even if you have them hidden on something like YouTube? No, no, I would, I would put the videos in full and, and all the other content, you know, on my website and the architect would make it really pretty. And then I'll put little snippets on YouTube and IGTV and Instagram to, with a link to drive people to your website. Because there's no point in having enormous traffic on YouTube. You're not going to get anything out of it. You want the traffic on yours. And whether I'm just, you I just mean, wouldn't you use that as a place to upload the content? And you, you wouldn't necessarily show it on YouTube, but you would use it as a way to, 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 to house it. You could, yeah. put, then you could, then you could make it private and put the links across, sure. That's a way to do it. But we can talk about, you know, another time we can have a discussion on where to uh, where to store your stuff, where to house your videos, because that's a whole separate a separate realm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anybody with any other questions? There we are. Well, I guess that wraps it up. Joel, have a good time. Did you learn something from this? Very good. That was great. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for doing this. Be sure to uh, go visit the VJ.com. You can sign up. 10-day free trial, isn't that right, Brett? 10-day free trial. And Brett, you want to promo your uh, your next uh, your next uh, Zoom session? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to be doing a Zoom the first week of December. Um, and in addition to taking some of the uh, look at some of the platforms and things, we're going to be talking about how to capture the best quality video with your smartphone. As Michael said, all of us have smartphones in our pockets, which all means that we all actually have uh, broadcast quality uh, cameras, uh, TV and movie making cameras in our pockets. So we're going to be looking at some best practices on how to get the best quality video out of your smartphone and also take a look at some shooting apps like Filmic Pro that can uh, help you make your footage look uh, very cinematic, like it looks in the Hollywood movies. So uh, stay tuned for more information on that. Great. Okay. So uh, thanks for coming and hopefully we'll uh, 